you are looking at some of the most fascinating life forms on Earth. Organisms like these inhabit every lake, pond, stream, and puddle. There are tens of thousands of different types. Mostly microscopic in size, hundreds, even thousands can be found in a single drop of water. Let's find out more about these fascinating organisms. The journey into a drop of water begins with a visit to your local pond. These students are collecting pond water to study later at school. They start by collecting some pond scum. This is usually filled with microorganisms. Then they add water. Finally, they cap their jar. There's enough air in the water to keep the organisms alive for a day or two. They'll also collect water from several spots. Back in the classroom, an eyedropper is used to deposit a drop of water onto a glass slide. The slide is then covered with a thin piece of glass called a cover slip. The slide is then placed on a microscope stage beneath two clips. The organisms you see in a drop of pond water may look strange, but they share much in common with you and me. Here's how you can prove it. Scrape the inside of your cheek with a toothpick. Dab this on a glass slide and cover it with a cover slip. Then place this under your microscope. As you can see, the inside of your mouth is made up of tiny uniform structures called cells. A cell is the basic unit of which all living things are composed. A person's entire body is made up of cells. Billions of cells that are not that much different from the ones that make up the organisms you find in a drop of water. In this example, the model on the right is meant to represent an animal cell and the one on the left, an amoeba, a single-celled organism you find in pond water. Both cells contain a nucleus. Some amoebas may contain more than one. The nucleus is the control center of the cell. Its job is to control the cell's activities, including reproduction. This is the nucleus of a cheek cell. Surrounding the nucleus is a substance called cytoplasm. This is a fluid in which many cell reactions occur. In the amoeba, the cytoplasm is constantly flowing, carrying cell materials with it. Every cell is surrounded by a membrane. The membrane is something like a sac that holds the cell together and gives it its shape. The cell membrane controls what goes into and comes out of a cell. In this dying organism, the membrane has broken and the organism explodes, spewing out its cytoplasm and other cell material. All organisms on Earth are made up of one or more cells. Many of the ones you find in a drop of water are made up of a single cell. Each one possesses everything it needs to live as a separate organism. Each cell is a complete, independent life form. The smallest organisms you can see with an ordinary microscope are bacteria. They're the tiny specks jittering about. Most bacteria are so small, it would take about 10,000 of them laid end to end to equal one centimeter. While they may be small, they grow in great numbers and are an important food for other microscopic organisms which feed on them practically non-stop. In this scene, a tiny pond organism creates a current directing countless bacteria into its mouth. Another important food source for many pond organisms are the algae. These are plant-like organisms which appear in a variety of forms. 
Some resemble plants you find on land. Algae belong to a larger group called protist, which include organisms that are neither plant nor animal. But like plants, most algae are filled with chlorophyll, a green substance that is similar to blood in animals and which permits photosynthesis, a process in which sunlight is converted into food. Under a microscope, you can often see the movement of chlorophyll within algae. Some algae exist as single cells, but many others join together in clusters called colonies. Each of these cells has a thin, barely visible tail called a flagellum, which helps propel it through water. Protists that possess flagella are called flagellates. This colony is called volvox and can consist of thousands of cells. Volvox colonies appeared billions of years ago and are thought to be the ancestors of multicellular plants we find throughout the world today. The cells in this colony move by sliding back and forth. They resemble a carpenter's folding ruler. The cells in other colonies form long strands. This one is called spirogyra. It gets its name from the spiral structures filled with chlorophyll. While pretty to look at under the microscope, large masses of it form the green smelly substance we refer to as pond scum. Closely related to algae are the euglenas. As with many algae, these protists are filled with green chlorophyll and rely on photosynthesis to obtain much of their food. They move by wriggling their bodies and by waving their flagella, which are located at their front ends. Euglenas have a reddish eye spot, which enables them to find areas of light, which is important for their survival. Other organisms closely related to the algae are the diatoms. They have hard outer walls and are found in both freshwater and oceans. Some diatoms are quite beautiful and are sometimes referred to as jewels of the sea. Some companies sell microscope slides with diatoms arranged in beautiful snowflake patterns. Common one-celled organisms found in pond water are the protozoa, of which there are thousands of types. Like algae, they too belong to the protists, but protozoa are more animal-like than plant-like. Protozoa means first animals, and they may very well resemble some of the first single-celled organisms that lived on Earth billions of years ago. Among the most common protozoa is the paramecium, of which there are many types. These organisms resemble tiny slippers as they swim about looking for food. Paramecia are covered by rows of short hair-like strands called cilia, which are visible here along their outer edges. A protozoan that has cilia on any part of its body is called a ciliate. Most of the protozoa you will encounter are ciliates. Paramecium moves by beating its cilia and spinning its body in a spiral motion. In open water, it can reach remarkable speeds. It is one of the fastest protozoa. In tight spaces, a paramecium is able to bend its body back on itself in order to make a sharp turn. They can distort their bodies to squeeze into narrow channels. They can contort their body so much it can be difficult to tell what they are. A paramecium eats by swimming back and forth through pond debris, feeding mostly on bacteria. A paramecium doesn't have a mouth. Instead, it has an oral groove. This is a channel along the side of its body which directs food into its gullet or stomach. You can see the oral groove more clearly as paramecia rotate their bodies. When you examine the interior of a paramecium, you will notice several round structures that open and close. These are called contractile vacuoles and work like little pumps. 
as a protozoan takes in and expels water. The vacuoles maintain the proper amount of water within a protozoan. You can learn a lot more about an organism by drawing it as you observe it. Your pictures don't have to win any awards. They're merely meant to help you become a better observer. Sometimes you will come across what appears to be two paramecia connected at the ends. This is actually a single paramecium reproducing itself in a process called fission. A single paramecium may divide up to three times in a single day. Other times you may encounter two paramecia joined at the sides. This is called conjugation. It is sometimes confused with fission, but it is not. During fission, a single paramecium reproduces itself lengthwise. During conjugation, two paramecia join at the sides in order to exchange cell material. Conjugation enables organisms to live longer and to better adapt to their environment. As you examine organisms under a microscope, you may wonder how small they really are. This may give you an idea. These are paramecia swimming about within an eye of a needle. As you can see, they are very small indeed. Another common protozoan you find in pond water is Blepharisma. Like Paramecia, it swims along feeding mostly on bacteria. Blepharisma has a large oral funnel or mouth lined with long cilia which it uses to direct food into the funnel. As with Paramecia and many other protozoa, Blepharisma reproduces itself through fission. These look like worms, but they're not. They're ciliates belonging to the group Spirostomum. They are just about the longest protozoa you'll find in a drop of water. They're gentle giants and feed mostly on bacteria. Deleptus is an unusual looking protozoan because of its long neck or trunk. It waves this through the water, directing food toward its mouth, located here at the base of the trunk. Deleptus feeds mostly on bacteria and tiny protozoa. Another protozoan with a long neck is Lacrimaria olor, sometimes referred to as the swan because of its resemblance to that bird. It whips its neck in and out of pond debris, searching for food. This protozoan, called Stentor, likes to anchor itself to pond debris as it sways back and forth through the water feeding on bacteria and small protozoa. Its large mouth is lined with long cilia, which it uses to create a current that helps direct food into its stomach. When it is disturbed, it will suddenly contract, disappearing into pond debris. Stentor takes on a different appearance when it detaches itself to swim freely through the water. The cilia lining its mouth are then used to help propel it. The delicate vorticella is another protozoan that likes to anchor itself to pond debris as it feeds. The cilia lining its mouth create twin currents pulling in bacteria. Larger organisms like these green algae get caught in the current as well, but are not consumed. Vorticella have coiled stalks which they can extend and contract quickly. They often appear in a cluster and seem to take turns extending and contracting. One of the largest protozoa is Bursaria. It is a giant in this microscopic world. With a large gaping mouth, it can swallow other protozoa whole. This unlucky paramecium is stuck in this Bursaria's stomach and will soon be digested. When it comes to hunting paramecia, none are better at it than didinium. These are the sharks of the microscopic world. They hunt by staying in constant motion as they search out paramecia, 
their only food. Once a didinium comes in contact with a paramecium, it stabs it with a needle-like organ that paralyzes the paramecium. The paramecium may struggle, but seldom is it able to escape. The didinium then sucks the paramecium into its stomach. Just a few didinia can wipe out a large group of paramecia in a very short time. When there are no more paramecia, Didinia will enter into a state of suspended animation in which they resemble spheres called cysts. They will remain inactive like this until there are more paramecia on which to feed. Many other protozoa form cysts as well, enabling them to survive unfavorable conditions such as drought. Among the best known protozoa are the amoebas, of which there are many types. This one is called Pelomyxa and is among the largest known amoebas. The stream of cytoplasm an amoeba sends out is called a pseudopod, which means false foot. Pseudopods not only enable an amoeba to move, but they are also used in obtaining food, circling and trapping unsuspecting organisms. Some organisms, like this tiny protozoan, appear to be attracted to amoebas hoping to feed on their contents, but frequently end up being swallowed themselves. If you examine an amoeba's cytoplasm, you will often find still living organisms struggling within it. An amoeba forms a bubble called a food vacuole around its food. The food, in this case a paramecium, is then digested within the vacuole. This organism resembles a protist, but is actually a rotifer, a multicellular animal. It gets its name from the cilia on top of its head, which resemble two spinning rotors and which draw in small organisms. Here you can also see its tiny, rapidly beating heart. A rotifer will stay anchored in one area as long as conditions are favorable, spinning its cilia and stretching its body in one direction than another. When it's time to move on, it'll release its foot and squiggle its way to a different spot. The Daphnia is another multicellular animal. It is considered a microcrustacean and is distantly related to shrimp, crabs, and lobsters. It moves by flicking its pair of large antennae. It has a single compound eye while the eye is quite large, the Daphnia's vision is probably poor. It is near its back where you find its heart, which beats at 300 times a minute. Females are sometimes seen carrying as many as 40 eggs in its brood chamber. Another interesting microcrustacean is the Cyclops, named after the mythical giant that possessed one eye. Cyclops are easy to identify by their long drooping antennae, which they use as sensory organs and for swimming. One of the Cyclops' favorite foods is paramecia, which it snaps up so quickly it is difficult to see. Seed shrimp are unusual because they are nearly entirely enclosed in a shell. Only their antennae and legs are exposed. They're not really shrimp, but they are related. The dark spot you see near the top of this one shell is its eye. When a seed shrimp dies and its shell opens, it sometimes resembles a delicate butterfly. The carnivorous hydra is named after the mythical monster with nine heads. It is normally seen attached to plants, stones, or debris, with its tentacles extended high above it. The tentacles are lined with sharp barbs that attach themselves to the hydra's prey. This Daphnia, though, is too large and breaks away from the hydra's grasp. This small cyclops is much more to the hydra's liking, and the hydra is able to stuff the cyclops into its mouth at the base of its tentacles. 
You have seen just a few of the fascinating organisms that you can find in a drop of water. While they may appear small, they are very important. Together, they form the bottom of the food chain and are an important food source for a variety of larger organisms, including fish. The algae are responsible for producing most of the air that we breathe, which is a byproduct of photosynthesis. Because they reproduce so quickly, protists are often used in the study of genetics. And some of these organisms are carriers of disease. This protist, called Giardia, can infect people when they drink contaminated water. And when these organisms are swallowed, they release bodies that can invade people's intestines. Millions of people die each year due to diseases carried by some types of bacteria and protists. Those are some of the reasons why scientists study these important organisms so that they can learn more about them. Even though they're very small, they're an important part of the world we live in. Organisms eat smaller organisms, which eat the smallest organisms, which are the protists. Protists provide a lot of the oxygen that we breathe. Protists can be responsible for disease. Because they're easy to grow, scientists can use them to study a number of different scientific principles. So, although small, they're very important. In this program, we have seen how the strange organisms found in a drop of water share much in common with you and me and consist of one or more cells. A cell is the basic unit of which all living things are composed and consists, at the very least, of a nucleus which controls cell activity, cytoplasm, a liquid in which many cell reactions occur, and the membrane which holds the cell together. A single cell can be a complete organism in itself, or it may be part of a multicellular organism. Single-celled organisms include bacteria, some algae, and a wide variety of protozoa. Multicellular organisms include rotifers, daphnia, hydras, and many others. These organisms are important because all of them form the bottom of the food chain, some produce oxygen, many are used in scientific studies, and a few of them cause disease. So as small as these organisms are, they are an essential part of the world around us.